Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We start our session entitled Integrated Approaches to Addressing Global Challenges Facing the Arctic and Boreal Regions. The first speaker is Professor of Forest Atmosphere Interactions, University of Helsinki, Finland, uh, Jana Beck. Jana Beck is working on uh, biochemical cycles and uh, terrestrial ecology linked to climate change in uh, boreal regions. She received her PhD in uh, zoological plant ecology from the University of Ulu in Finland. Her expertise is in forest management, ecosystem climate feedback, and ecosystem services. She has actively been involved in the development of national, European, and global research infrastructures for integrated long-term observations of Earth's system. Professor Beck is mm, the vice chair of the Institute for Atmosphere and Earth System Research INAR at the University of Helsinki. This is a very famous institute in this world. She's author of more than 140 peer-reviewed papers in journal and books, and member in the Finnish IPBES panel. She's academician of the International Academy of Eurasian Studies and has been awarded by the Pro Sienta and the Open Science Award. Please, uh, Jana, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor uh, Gifjani, and I'm sharing my screen. Please tell me if you are seeing it. Yes, that's fine. Okay, good. So thank you for for uh, invitation, and I'm very happy to present. Uh, in this session, because I think that the topic is, is really, really important. And what I try to bring to you as a starting point for discussion and maybe thinking about is what, what is the role of the systematic observations in the Arctic and Boreal regions that are capable of addressing and maybe also answering some of the global challenges and questions that are currently ongoing but also what we are going to see in, in the future when, um, for example, climate change is, is uh, affecting our regions. I have two co-authors listed here in this presentation, but of course there are many more. Um, the two that are uh, listed here are founding, founding members of uh, PEAKS, Marko Kulmala, academician from the University of Helsinki and Institute for Atmosphere and Earth System Research, and another one is Mikhail Mittel from Austria and Germany, who is the uh, key figure of Elter ESRI, European Long Term Ecosystem uh, Observation uh, Network, which I will be uh, introducing you in the uh, presentation as well. But first, in, in a few words, uh, I think that we all are aware, and I don't go into details in what uh, kind of challenges the Arctic and Boreal regions are currently facing. This is just a few examples of anthropogenic and, and climate change pressures. On the left-hand side figure, the small dots show the anthropogenic activities around the Arctic and, and the northern boreal areas. And you see that there are lots of dots in many places, which shows that there's high uh, industrial interest and high um, mining interests, for example, occurring in the circumpolar and circumarctic regions. So they are clearly something that um, is affecting our, our region already very intensively for decades. The other more current research uh, challenge or global challenge is, of course, the climate change pressure. The figure on the right hand side shows uh, with a color coding 
uh, how intensive the climate warming has been over the last 30 decades in these re different regions. And the redder color means the more changes have already been occurring. And the vast um, majority of the changes in the boreal and Arctic regions, of course, are focused on the Arctic Sea and the regions that are surrounding the, the um, Arctic, um, Arctic Sea, like, like the uh, ecosystems in Siberia and northern, northern Europe. So these kind of challenges are requiring the science and society to uh, urgently design good tools how to respond to these challenges. And the thing that I'm suggesting and we are suggesting is that we need urgently to provide systematic and integrated observations on the state of our ecosystems, how people are uh, affecting the ecosystems. Um, there should be dedicated programs and in situ research stations that are capable of integrated approaches to observe, monitor and research the Arctic and surrounding areas. The map is showing uh, one of example of population studies in um, Arctic biodiversity assessment done some years ago. And uh, here again, the details are not so important, but the colors of the small dots that you might see in your screen reflect the number of populations that have been observed in these different regions. And uh, the striking phenomenon here is that most of these bubbles small dots are yellow or orange, which means that the observations on biodiversity assessment have only been done based on one or two populations only, which is way too little to be able to say anything about how habitats are changing, how the connectiveness of the environment is changing concerning the biodiversity uh, values of, of uh, the Arctic and Boreal regions. So clearly there is need for increasing the intensity and also the systematic observation uh, schemes. Repeated measurements, of course, are needed to follow up the trends and, and observe what kind of um, drivers uh, are, are affecting the state of the ecosystems. In support to observations on the ground, which is uh, what we do uh, in the Institute for Atmospheric and Earth System Research, of course, remote sensing and satellite observations and other airborne observations are definitely needed to be able to upscale from site-based studies to regional place based studies. And there has been um, initiatives uh, in, um, in recent years uh, towards this direction. So Marco Kulmala was providing um, nature commentary in 2018 where he said that uh, we urgently need a continuous comprehensive monitoring global earth observatory and this was commented or um, continued in a in a dialogue between the um, uh, chinese um, academician of professor guo huadong who is a chair of the DBAR Institute of Remote Sensing and Digital Earth in, in China, who was also saying that there is clearly need to take the first steps, how to maintain, how to in, in, uh, investigate systematically the environment. What is existing at the moment is quite promising, at least. I would, I would say that we are starting towards these steps. And here I have, a few examples of uh, what is existing in the Arctic and Boreal regions. There is a vast uh, network of stations, field stations. We have, um, uh, they are located in the Arctic and, and Alpine areas that is hosted by the Interact Network. Um, that's a non-profit organization and, uh, and there are now currently about 90 stations in the circumpolar region contributing to Interact. A very prominent European example is ICOS, which is the integrated carbon observing system that has uh, 
tens of stations, both observing the atmospheric conditions and, and greenhouse gas concentrations, but also the ecosystems and how uh, the fluxes are created and developed in the ecosystems and the ocean ecosystems as well, which is seen here in this uh, map with, uh, with uh, these lines that are showing the ship tracks. Um, then there is ELTER, which is the European Long-Term Ecosystem and Socio-Ecology Research Infrastructure, that has currently about 400 stations around Europe. Uh, about 60 of them are located above the uh, 58 degrees north, so um, not a huge number, but still significant number, and it is a, a very well established network already uh, several uh, decades ago and it's currently in development phase for becoming a European uh, institution and legal entity. And last but not least and concerning the vast area of uh, east east of Europe is the peaks network which is here in the bottom of the figure. This map is showing the uh, in situ network of stations that have been identified by the PEAKS program as being able to contribute to the observation networks in um, China, in uh, Far East uh, areas of um, uh, Central, uh, Central uh, Asia, and then also in, in very many areas in Russia. So it is quite promising, but of course, uh, we have to say that um, there are still huge areas that are not covered by these observations. So by far, are we not finished with this uh, creation of this global network? One of the examples of global networks is uh, the ILTER, International uh, Long-Term Ecological Observation Network, that is kind of the parent network of European ILTER. And these dots show you the global distribution of the international uh, elder network. By far, Europe is most, most populated, but there are huge numbers of stations, for example, in Japan, in Australia, in South America, and in, in North America. But of course, still big gaps existing in the elder network, for example, in Russia and in Canada. About 50% of these observations are coming from terrestrial sites, and then the rest, the rest of them is, is somehow linked to waters, either uh, oceans or coastal or freshwaters. Europe has taken steps to formalize this process, and, um, and the European ESFRI process is giving visions for development of these uh, infrastructures. Here is an example of the European uh, Elder Network. Uh, we have a vision that we will be providing well being for all citizens, sustainable human interactions with nature, and enabling environment for scientific discovery and insights. So these are great visions. And what we want to do is to address the challenges on biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, eutrophication, and pollution and overall the sustainable management of natural resources, including waters, soils, biodiversity and ecosystems. ELTER has designed a station network um, covering different disciplines, and it wants to serve the different research communities by providing uh, basic infrastructure like the stations, but also integrated observations on the geosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, and human sphere, which is very important in thinking about the Anthropocene and anthropogenic pressures. One example of a um, comprehensive observation station is the one that I come from. It's located in central Finland. It's called Smear Station. Um, the Smear comes from the Station for Measuring e Ecosystem Atmosphere Relations. And what is observed is system structure and functions, the main drivers of the changes, and then interactions and feedbacks between these disturbance effects. And we co-locate and, and co collaborate with many inter international 
uh, initiatives. Um, ELTER is one of those co-located uh, infrastructures in our site and what ELTER provides to sites and also other people um, and organizations using its services is the registry of long-term observation facilities. So you can go to the DIMES org and search for sites and search for keywords um, for parameters, for, for habitats, for ecosystems, locate sites in this way. Also, you can locate some data uh, products from um, a selected repository for time series data. You can do data discovery and visualization. And here is one example of uh, visualization and data uh, contextual information that is derived from DIMES SDR concerning one site in Austria, central Austria, Turbelboden site, where the uh, W. Uh, MO uh, Cordex uh, project, regional climate project, was used as um, forecasting to forecast uh, the seasonal uh, weather and, and climate events that will happen in the near future or in, in the far future. So this kind of services can be provided to sites that are registered in, in, the, in the DIMES and, and uh, providing some uh, basic information on the, on the sites. And my last slide is about the global perspective once more. So as I said, the in situ observations are really important, providing the uh, necessary parameters, but they can be much more when they are connected to the global organizations and what ELTER has done and, and the International Long-Term Observation Network is done is that it has uh, connected to GEO, uh, the Global Earth Observation Network, that is uh, uh, observing from remote, uh, remotely sensed uh, data. We are providing the uh, verification and, uh, and calibration uh, for parameters that can be observed and then scaled with the help of the GEO services to use, uh, be, be able to use, for example, in global terrestrial observation systems. And this is all I had to present. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beck. Um, let's uh, work in the following way, if you have no objection, that we will uh, have uh, two questions um, right away after the presentation, and then the other questions will be in the end uh, during the uh, discussion. Um, two questions, please, who would like to ask something? Um, I would like to ask one question. I visited a, a, a SMER uh, flagship station in Hutala. That was just before a pandemic came. And I was really impressed by the idea and by its realization. Um, how all those uh, observations, uh, facilities, activities like ICOST, ELTER, ASTRIS, ACTRIS, CEOs, how they are linked to uh, SMEAR? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, the key word here is the co-location. So the, our smear station is providing a kind of, maybe we could, you could call it a skeleton or a framework where these different kind of initiatives and research infrastructures can cooperate. And for example, concerning ICOS and um, the ELTER, there are a lot of, common parameters like soil moisture or soil temperature that are needed for creating the comprehensive observations for both. So it's no need to make them duplicate. We can do it once and use it for different user, uh, user groups and for different purposes. So this is our uh, way of doing things cost efficiently and also integrate the different disciplines and different organizations so that they can eff effectively uh, 
use the uh, data and services that are provided by the station. Um, I noticed that um, the activities of SMER um, are closely linked to INAR, where you work, and um, Dr. Zankulmala, a friend of mine. So, um, do all those networks you listed, like ICOS, ELTER, etc., they are also linked to INAR, or this is rather international? They are international organizations. INAR is an institute at the Helsinki University. So it is like a department or a faculty at the Helsinki University. It's a internal structure that we have. And it is also a very, very multidisciplinary organization. So it, it uh, covers uh, disciplines from physics and chemistry and atmospheric sciences to limnology and forest sciences, plant sciences. Um, it is, um, as university uh, departments are both active in research, but also education and, and also um, addressing the societal challenges like, like climate change, for example. Helsinki University has uh, made a strategy where it has nominated or identified key research challenges that it wants its uh, science communities to address. And one of them is, of course, climate change problematics in many, many kind of uh, ways from many disciplinary perspectives. And INAR is one of the organizations that is doing that um, in connection to its partnerships with PEAKS and with uh, uh, ICOS and, and so on. Would it be right understanding uh, to say uh, that all those uh, listed uh, networks, organizations, they have their own data centers. At the same time, they um, provide data to SMER as well, is it right? There, that, that's true. Um, uh, we have, in SMER, we have our own data portal, which is called um, Smart SMER. And that collects all the data that is uh, collected from the four different smear stations in Finland. So we have not only that one that you have visited, but three others as well. So this one data portal collects all our data. And then it is connected to the data portals from ICOS or ELTER so that there is no need to duplicate the data reserve, uh, reservoirs or the, the uh, repositories, but they can harvest from our data portal. And that's very... also a cost efficiency issue when you don't have to upload all the data many times to different places. But where, once you have created your own data repository, then the others can link to that and use the services. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, so we move to the second speaker. Uh, this is the, uh, Dr. Sergei Chalov. He is Deputy Dean for International Relations of the Faculty of Geography, Lomonosov Moscow State University. He received all his degrees from this university. Uh, for the... Um, since uh, 2018, he is an associate professor of this of the uh, geographical department of LMSU. Mm. Since uh, 2015, he serves as vice president and secretary of the International Commission on Continental Erosion of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. Since um, 2016, um, Sergei is General Secretary of Geography, Environment, Sustainability Journal and Head of the Pan-Eurasian Experiment Moscow Office. His research interests are focused on sediment, sediment quality and quantity, remote sensing application for sediment transport, fluvial processes, stream ecology and biodiversity. Please, um, Sergei, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for 
an excellent introduction. And uh, so I will go for my presentation now. That's okay. So uh, I would uh, start from the uh, same few uh, words, like uh, to continue the previous speaker, Professor Beck, mentioning that uh, there is uh, this uh, gap in the Arctic domain related to the um, low quantity of the stations for monitoring on various environmental processes which exist in Russia. And uh, this is uh, mostly the focus of what would I uh, talk in this uh, speech. And uh, the thing related to these gaps in the knowledge are focusing on more terrestrial uh, things and firstly related to the fluxes, which um, bring together the huge terrestrial ecosystem uh, and uh, Arctic Ocean. And if we look on the Arctic drainage, this, this is uh, the huge territory and uh, our, the main part of this in terms both of the hydrology and uh, in terms of the lands are covering by the territory of Russia and in particular the territory of Siberia. And uh, we can mention that something like 58% uh, of the Arctic terrestrial flux is uh, coming from Russian Arctic drainage. And this territory then even goes uh, to the south up to Mongolia and steppe and China. So, and this is in terms of this hydrological perspective, this is also Arctic. Uh, but uh, there is a few things which we um, should mention when we want to build uh, comprehensive and integrated knowledge. And the first is that uh, this river influx to Arctic Ocean uh, Firstly, from Siberian rivers is almost unknown. Uh, and this means that we have uh, the big gap in understanding of uh, the very argent and challenging processes which, is, uh, which are related to the thawing permafrost and changes in uh, net precipitation and runoff, which are, are associated with these uh, general climate uh, fluctuations or climate change. And uh, in following this, we have very vague uh, work um, understanding of one, on what is the impact of the uh, terrestrial flux into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, generally in this uh, very fastly changing environment, we have to admit that the estimates of the fluvial experts are, are required to improve fundamental understanding of the land ocean coupling. And these fluvial experts are almost unknown. And on this photo, you can see that it's very nice uh, uh, reflection of what I would, uh, what I said before, is this thawing permafrost on the bank of the, one of the largest Siberian rivers, the Kolomar River, and very well known in uh, glaciology, or in the cryptology, better to say, the area which is called uh, Yidoma, the one yard in the downstream of Kolema, which is uh, visually can be seen as the melting, as the shifting area with very fast uh, changes of the bank line during the daytime. So this is uh, during the hot summer season, which came here to this area. And the big flux of the also very important to the biochemical processes in the Arctic of the organic material goes uh, toward the Arctic Ocean, and we have before no really background to estimate this uh, flux. Firstly, because of the um, there is no well constrained estimates of the uh, different loads, and the material is uh, carried out by rivers in very uh, different ways. And the point samples, as it's usually done for in geochemistry, are not sufficient to provide us with the knowledge of the flux. And it means that we have a great uncertainties in the particulate and in the dissolved chemicals flux in these huge rivers. And so also the final uh, thing, which also make the knowledge very comprehensive is that the processes in the deltas uh, remain generally unknown. What's happened with this flux in the most downstream area? 
And based on this, we are here in Moscow State University under PX umbrella and center with collaboration with different institutions set up a um, uh, comprehensive monitoring program uh, campaign, uh, which we called Arctic Flux. And this uh, program was started in 2018 with the focus on making a new methodological impact on the knowledge. Uh, and so on the second uh, side of this story, that we are focusing to provide a regular uh, campaigns with uh, this novel uh, type of the field investigation. And uh, for general uh, knowledge, what we are working with, what this river uh, looks like, I will show this photo, which is the Op River, but it's not the Op River generally, it's only the very small branch of the Op River, which is only, uh, this uh, branch is only 15% of the total Op River discharge. And then you can imagine that this is the scales, what is the scales of this uh, flux, is, uh, what is the scales of the monitoring which we have to uh, carry out and what uh, is the generally this system looks like. So, and uh, the four catchments, uh, which are the biggest uh, catchments of the Siberian Arctic, the Oplena, Yenisei, and Kolyma rivers, were, uh, let's say, cut in the main downstream by our monitoring uh, profiles stations, which were aimed to make, uh, uh, to carry, to take the information about the both hydrology, the water, and the chemistry of the moving matter towards the ocean. Uh, and uh, since 2018, we were uh, developing the methodological approach and making the first um, campaigns. So with the focus that we are not able to carry out the constant measurements, but we are focusing on making the most, um, to, to, to take or to get the most different conditions in terms of hydrology. And here the dots represent these uh, times of our field our campaigns and the uh, blue lines is the uh, water discharge of these four rivers during the um, these initial stages of this monitoring effort. And uh, the main focus in terms of the methodological is the, that we are looking on making the uh, combination between the uh, novel technological advances in the hydrological styles like uh, Doppler profiles, which make a very full and very detailed picture of the river uh, with the depth integrated models of the geochemical flux. So, and combining this, uh, we can think about uh, going towards the comprehensive knowledge of this hydrogeochemical flux. And the first results are very promising, which we uh, have and which we, um, which are based on the very big um, data bank of the geochemistry. And the results uh, are summi summarized briefly on the next slides. What's, we, what, what's fundamental knowledge in the uh, Arctic uh, knowledge we can bring from this uh, monitoring efforts. And the first thing which is um, uh, on the table now is the uh, knowledge about the geochemistry of these rivers and uh, uh, there are a few things which are clearly seen. The main are uh, that uh, in general, if we take the well-known uh, hydrogeochemistry enrichment factor, we can say that the rivers in general are not uh, uh, really polluted. Uh, uh, but uh, there is the one um, outstanding uh, river which is uh, goes far from the others in terms of the um, human pollution is the Op rivers. Op river and we clearly see that uh, in terms of the heavy metals and uh, uh, some of the other microelements, uh, the levels of pollution are quite high compared both to these rivers and also to the uh, um, general world averages. And uh, if we uh, compare the uh, statistics which we have in the database with the uh, other uh, uh, indices like the Clarks, and uh, we can see the um, variability of particulate chemical elements concentration in the 
all these uh, four studied rivers. And uh, also the, the, the thing which confirmed the previous statement that uh, in general compared to these world averages, the rivers uh, represent very specific environments and some of the elements which are related uh, in this case, not to the any types of the human activities, but mostly to the mythology of the these huge catchments are enriched uh, or uh, high in terms of the concentration, whereas there is the big number of the elements which are below the world averages. A similar story goes with the dissolved chemical elements are in these fluxes, and we can identify both. Uh, uh, elements which are related to the human impacts. And again, the op river will be outstanding in this regard, uh, as well as the other elements which are mostly related to the, let's say, natural processes like uh, uh, the mentioned in these red uh, boxes. And this means that there is the very uh, comprehensive integration of the hydroclimatic processes of the erosion and of the human impacts on this uh, huge flux into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, summarizing this geochemical part of the existing, at the moment, this three years field company, we can also identify the uh, averages in this, between these rivers in terms of the enrichment of particulate and dissolved matter in these largest uh, rivers. And then we uh, can have a background to go further on and to come to the fluxes. And this is uh, the way through linking the trace element concentration uh, with the uh, sediment concentration. And these regional types of the uh, relationships we are able now to get. And this is the way forward for such kind of methodological output of the study when we integrate the hydrodynamic and geochemistry. And from the water discharge using the and sediment flux, we go to particulate flux by grain classes, which are related to the sediment flux. And then we are going to the assessment of the uh, average null chemical flux. And here, the first estimates, which are here. So that's the water. And the water to the from these four rivers to the Arctic is uh, well known in terms of what is uh, how it looks like. So the Yenisei is the leader. But then we go to the elements, and here the situation is much more comprehensive. So the water is not the water runoff is not completely the leader in this um, in this uh, chemical flux. And so uh, we are uh, then identify that, for example, there is a huge variability in the particulate matter exist in these rivers and the null runoff is extremely high in the NSA compared to other rivers. But uh, in other more toxic elements, the situation is quite different. And again, the, there is the big uh, variability between the, the system exists. And the, uh, that means that, that the system is quite comprehensive, but uh, yes, what I said before, that there is the both hydroclimatic impacts and uh, processes more of geological, geochemical uh, background and the human impacts affect this distribution. But of course, this is the way, this is the initial years of this monitoring campaign, and we hope that uh, on these maps, which plot the knowledge in the Pan-Arctic, this monitoring effort by our university and our partners will uh, close these gaps a little bit, at least in this hydrogeochemical uh, marine perspective. So with this, I would like to thank you, to thank the uh, conveners of this uh, session and the organizers for this very important event. And uh, thank you all for attention. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, uh, two questions, please. If any. Okay, no questions. Thank you very much once again to you, Sergei, and academician um, Nikolai Sergeyevich, uh, um, yes, thank you. with whom you um, presented this very interesting study together. So uh, we come. Um, to the next talk.
that will be delivered by Florian Kraxner. Florian Kraxner has been the deputy director of the YASA Ecosystem Services and Management Program, ESM, since January 2009. Uh, he first joined YASA in 2001 to work on land use change in forestry. He has been coordinator of various activities in the areas of carbon uh, potentials, benefits through global earth observation and terrestrial adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Dr. Kraxner is particularly interested in socioeconomic and ecological sustainability of natural resources. Among other roles, he serves on various scientific boards within the framework of Future Earth, International Union of Forest Research Organizations, and Asian um, Re uh, Resilience Center. He is president of the International Boreal Forest Research Association. Please, Dr. Kraxner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Guishani. Um, I hope you can hear me all and uh, see my slides. Okay, uh, yes, you're that's nodding, fine. so I simply go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. This is a great opportunity to also show, based on my background, a little bit more on, on what IASA is doing with respect to uh, boreal forests uh, in the area under consideration here. And of course, this is also highly interlinked with the work uh, we are doing in the IPFRA, you mentioned it, the International Boreal Forest Research Association. So, <clears throat> One of the uh, big things is that um, there is huge expectations uh, from all forests over the world and particularly uh, from boreal um, forests also with respect, but not only to climate change mitigation and a very long list of SDGs. So let me show here a little bit what, what we know, how we go about that, are there novel ideas we can pursue and how uh, can we do that? <clears throat> I mentioned already that SDGs uh, are very important in the context of forests and of course also in the boreal forest context. So just to mention a few, no poverty, poverty uh, good health and well-being, clean water, affordable and clean energy, industry, innovation, sustainable consumption, um, climate action, life on land, etc. But particularly, I would like to um, have a look at the climate action and the linkage to the, the forest. Um, we saw already from Professor Beck uh, that, of course, climate is uh, hitting um, the uh, boreal and, and polar area very heavily. And we need to learn how, we, how to deal with that, but also how we use <clears throat> the forest best in order to respond uh, to this uh, climate change. Um, unfortunately, we all know that um, looking at the climate pathways we are on, we are um, not he heading yet into the right direction. Um, we see that, uh, for instance, we have to soon uh, bend the curve very drastically and uh, also move uh, towards the center and end of this century uh, towards negative emissions even. And uh, <clears throat> one question is how we are going to do that. And uh, of course, also here, I will have a look at, at what uh, the forests uh, could contribute and how. It is important here to understand that, uh, for instance, the national determined um, uh, contributions are um, in many countries to a large content uh, based on uh, land and here based on forest contributions. However, if we accumulate all these um, NDCs that have been submitted and are voluntary under the um, Paris Agreement, 
um, they only add up to one third of the emission reductions that we have. That means we have to strengthen here very much our ambition uh, because the UN gap report, for instance, says that if we don't close this gap um, of this uh, between one third and full uh, by 2030, and this is not even 10 years ago, then it will be close to impossible, very hard to reach the Paris uh, agreements on two degrees um, uh, maximum warming. So um, what is the starting base in order to address these problems? And starting base is, of course, as always, um, information. And um, it's, it's a kind of a, a strange thing, but um, we do not know globally uh, very exactly what is the forest extent. And the same problem, of course, also exists uh, in the boreal area. We see here older maps uh, that have been produced um, uh, quite some time ago. This is a, a simple map, uh, which is about 20 years old already. Um, then there have been improvements over time and maybe one important uh, source is here, uh, the science publication from Gautier, uh, where this all became a little bit more um, detailed and uh, more information came up, for instance, with respect to managed versus unmanaged and here also um, permafrost being considered or on the right hand side, uh, the amount of biomass uh, <clears throat> stored in these forests. However, um, this, is, this is not enough yet. Uh, what we did, we moved on and uh, for instance, combined this uh, also with, um, with market and sustainability information and created the, the first map on a one kilometer resolution that also considers, for instance, certification and the way of sustainable management all over um, the boreal forest extent. Uh, you can see this here by different colors. The blue is uh, certified uh, and um, the red one is managed overall. Um, not yet enough. Um, the importance here is always that um, we cannot act in this uh, kind of arena only based on scientific information. We always have to also consider political um, um, considerations, sensitivities, but of course also borders. And um, so we went ahead uh, together with the Circumboreal Working Group and tried to come up with the first politically agreed boreal forest map. And this was a kind of a next step. And here you see the, the final outcome. And if you are wondering what was the difference to the one before, uh, one example is just here at the border between uh, Sweden and, and Norway, where uh, um, the um, local authorities insisted that um, not our scientific based um, map is correct, but uh, what they dedicated towards managed and unmanaged forests. So we had to correct this in order to be able to publish this in a report, which for the first time uh, included um, all circumboreal uh, countries, uh, including, of course, Russia, the Nordic countries um, uh, with Norway, Sweden and Finland, uh, Canada and the US. And this has been done in the framework of the, the IPFRA insight process. And this is the first report, which is currently under scientific review here, which is called Sustainable Boreal Forest Management challenges and opportunities for climate change mitigation. And again, uh, the first time all these countries, including political support has been contributing here and that was even requested by a ministerial meeting from this circumboreal working group. So you see the importance here of working together very closely also with the political decision makers. So um, <clears throat> in order to move on uh, with the idea here, um, one idea is uh, to check, okay, what can now the forest and particularly the boreal forest contribute? Uh, and one option is uh, nature climate solution. So the direct uh, contributions to um, um, mitigation by creating negative emissions. And these negative emissions, land-based ones, uh, and uh, in combination with forest, for instance, can be 
um, uh, can be done through a combination of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage on the one hand side, but on the other hand, uh, also through afforestation. What is important that needs to be considered here is that um, all uptake that is not directly caused by human activities cannot be accounted under the UNF C rules. So uh, whatever we do here in terms of afforestation and reforestation, it needs to be additional, an additional effect to what is already happening um, from nature. Um, here is a little comparison of uh, some technologies uh, that can provide negative emissions. And we see here in the lower part, uh, afforestation that can be quite uh, effective in terms of reaching up to uh, four uh, gigatons uh, CO2 um, sequestered and uh, put negative uh, per year. And uh, the costs are relatively okay compared with all the other uh, potentials and, uh, and types of emission technologies here. Of course, we need to consider that there are different uh, land requirements, different, for instance, water requirements, but that also, for instance, uh, technologies like BECs, bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage produce on the one hand side also energy for substitution from biomass and, uh, and afforestation uh, per se does not produce any substitution energy. So here comparison is, uh, is difficult. In the end, what counts is the negative emission potential. Um, if we, uh, for instance, compare the specs technology with afforestation, reforestation and restoration under uh, the SDGs and the nature contribution to people uh, schemes, we see that, and we don't have to read that, but just look at the individual uh, round dots here with little numbers in it. You can see it here in the outer circle and inner circle, that there are many more overlaps between afforestation, reforestation, and restoration uh, with uh, the SDGs, for instance, and uh, the NCPs. Then on the other hand, where we uh, uh, look at BACs only. So these multiple effects are also very important and can probably compensate for the substitutional energy that can be produced uh, from uh, a BACs technology. Okay, but the big question is now, where can we do this afforestation and reforestation? And of course, this is an interesting question and the most important question and what are the potentials? So let us look very quickly uh, into what can be done in the Eurasia and, and circumboreal context. Um, we first, of course, have to look what is generally globally possible in terms of uh, the increment, what is needed in terms of NPP here. And um, we have to reduce this. For instance, we only would like to look into areas uh, which provide an, an increment potential that is above one cubic meter per hectare per year. Otherwise, it wouldn't pay off. Uh, then, of course, we have to uh, subtract currently forested land and uh, that uh, cannot be used because it's already used and there would be no additionality effect. And then we have to uh, reduce all that from cropland and urban land, etc. And what in the end is left over is a rough potential for, for afforestation uh, with a geographic identification here of uh, three gigatons per year carbon. Uh, this is an important knowledge. However, um, also this we need to further um, play down and, and see um, if we can identify additional afforestation area and one area particularly in the, uh, in the boreal forest arena and uh, in the circumboreal context is uh, probably uh, abandoned arable land. Uh, and you might think that uh, this is very difficult to control. We do it here and, and observe, can observe this with uh, satellite imagery, with remote sensing, but we also do studies like here uh, where we looked at Russia in, and uh, further eight uh, former Soviet Union countries. And you see all the red dots here. This is actually abandoned forest land. If we zoom into that, for instance, in Königsberg, you see that even large areas of certain territories are completely abandoned. 
And uh, if we look around Moscow, um, it's surprising how much arable land is abandoned there. So there would be good um, potential for afforestation, particularly because we know that this has been a highly productive land for arable, uh, for, for agriculture. And on the other hand, there is already infrastructure available. Okay, statistics also show that uh, with our uh, combined uh, ground uh, truthing and remote sensing methodologies, uh, we can really uh, say that uh, there is more uh, available uh, abandoned land available than we thought from the statistics. And uh, the last point I want to make here, um, how about all the forest fires which are ongoing? Um, is maybe this area also available for huge afforestation activities? And we <clears throat> know that globally under each of the um, um, uh, different scenarios, the burned area is increasing. Of course, more increasing under the extreme um, um, RCP 8.5. Uh, but this in, in terms means that there is a huge uh, climate impact on the forests and we need to deal with that. So one way is uh, to identify these areas and uh, we looked here into the Russian Federation uh, with our FLAM model and what are the accumulated um, and aggregated areas uh, that have been burned. And we see uh, if we zoom into Krasnoyarsk Krai, for instance, that uh, this is a substantive area, um, particularly that only um, areas are marked in red here that increase or exceed 100 hectares burned. So theoretically, um, and wouldn't there be other problems like accessibility, et cetera, this would be huge um, potential in order to uh, do afforestation and we compared here three different scenarios where we do nothing in terms of uh, yeah, um, natural uh, revegetation, then there is an assisted and uh, highly assisted um, scenario and we can see that uh, over the course of, uh, of this century, we could achieve here an additional 1.2 gigatons if we help here with uh, active afforestation on these burned areas. So these are first rough estimates, but in addition, of course, there is other ways um, that can be also considered here as available potentials. Uh, this is uh, restor uh, or reforestation of areas designated for forest land, afforestation of abandoned land, assisted forest migration because it's getting warmer so uh, the forest is moving up north we could accelerate that a bit etc and other uses so we can come up to an additional 600 million tons carbon um, per year over this century so these are our interests at the moment where we would like to look into and how are we going to do that we for instance uh, are uh, coordinating a large um, ESA, European Space Agency based forest observation system uh, project with many partners, for instance, from the region, particularly from Russia, where we have uh, permanent sample plots uh, where we do not only collect data, but also connect all the people and the scientists behind these sample plots together, which is extremely important. And this information is uh, then, of course, published also in high level journals like here in scientific data. And another example is um, that this data that we collect then uh, with this network can help us to also um, uh, help understanding better um, if there are um, knowledge gaps. For instance, uh, there was a shift in, in, in Russia from an old national forest inventory system to a new one, and suddenly um, there were quite different figures out there, and uh, with, uh, with this uh, network we could uh, uh, already submit a very interesting uh, paper to a nature scientific report, which is under review there, uh, where we can show that actually the, the biomass uh, availability is 44% higher in Russia than the forest register showed. And you see that there is very huge uh, participation, of course, from uh, IASA, 
uh, and, and European uh, institutions, but uh, the, the massive contributors are, of course, uh, the Russian institutions, where um, the 2020 latest figures from this national forest inventory have been used, and this is the first time uh, that uh, something is going to be published here with this new data. So what are some takeaway messages here? I will just pick a few. Uh, I, I would like to remind uh, my first point I made with this information mapping and uh, collection of uh, scientific information. We do not have only the importance to look scientifically into the details, but that we also have to uh, see as a particularly as a science to a policy institute that there are sensitivities on political, but also other so social and socioeconomic levels that need to be considered. There's huge pressure on the forest and we need to think how under this pressure we can still uh, make the forest contribute uh, to mitigate climate change. Uh, and another important thing is that always this integration of different methodologies is important. So permanent sample plots, for instance, on the ground combined with uh, top-down information from uh, remote sensing, uh, this is uh, probably the way uh, forward that we need to go and co-benefits are extremely important. It does not help only to look at the direct economic output uh, of some calculations, but we know, for instance, that if a methodology like afforestation provides also green jobs and supports the bioeconomy, not only directly, but also indirectly, this is equally important. And last not least, I would like to mention that uh, we have no time to lose. We need to start uh, looking into this and turning it into action. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Krasner, for a very impressive presentation. Uh, who, have, uh, um, who has uh, questions to the speaker? OK, I do. Um, <clears throat> There is a um, proposal, a plan, uh, incentives, if you wish, uh, to uh, probably to deploy a smear station um, of this um, Finnish international system presented in the first talk of uh, Dr. Bach uh, in Russia, if this is the case. And this is, is under the discussion nowadays. If this is the case, where do you think would be the best place for such um, comprehensive observatory as far as uh, forests are concerned? Another thing. Um, very good question, because <laughs> probably uh, not, uh, not only forest belongings uh, can be considered here, um, but uh, definitely um, <clears throat> if this is a, you mean a center of research being established there? Um, no, no, not really. This is a flag a, well, like a flag, uh, flagship station of okay. Smear. Well, like for instance, is deployed now in uh, Estonia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, yeah, again, uh, the question is not easy to answer. Um, considerations would be, uh, of course, uh, a forest density. Um, um, I think it cannot be at the, at the brink of forests. It should be probably in uh, rather unmanaged areas in order to get uh, insight that is, is looking at um, unmanaged versus managed forest. So these are considerations I would, uh, I would, con I would bring in here. Um, but this is probably also a question to Professor Beck here, where such a station would be ideally placed. It's a, it's a very good question and I never thought about that, but I think uh, it would be interesting to uh, cover a huge territory um, of a forest that is under change. And I think that uh, there are some other places that cover well 
the managed uh, area of forests and uh, Russia would uh, be an optimal territory in order to look into a vast area of unmanaged forest. Um, there is always one thing that should be taken into account is that let's say um, Eastern Siberia looks as an ideal uh, location, but there is no infrastructure there. Yeah. You should have electricity, you should have roads, you should be capable to come by airplane or even helicopter, all that. Okay, so um, other questions, please, to the speaker. If I may comment, and I have also a question to Florian. Um, this was a good question on the, on the station location and, and uh, distribution, and I think there's no right or wrong answers. What Marco Kulmala said in his nature paper was that approximately in 1000 kilometer from a distance apart from, the, from them, each other would be kind of um, one way of looking at it, but of course it would be needed to be looked at from scientific perspective. So what, what is meaningful? What is the information gap that we are wanting to address here? And toward this end, I think that the one solution is that there can be a hierarchical station network, not only consisting these kind of master stations or flagship stations, but also including some that are not measuring everything, but are measuring enough basic uh, variables that can then be used for upscaling and modeling the effects. So there, there is enough uh, food for models to be then used in, in interpolate, interpolating and upscaling the results that would be kind of a, maybe a, a intermediate solution from, from the station perspective. Um, since we're speaking here about the big data, apparently the um, number of parameters measured is in, important. So for instance, as I remember your flagship observatory in Hutala measures more than thousands of parameters. Yes. So what will be the number of parameters to measure uh, for the beginning? You think? Currently we, it yeah. Parameters. yeah. Is it valid or not? Or? Well, I would say that thousand is definitely way too much for measuring in many stations. That's the flagship station property that you can do in these case, cases, but I would, probably go something like close to 100 parameters would be even sufficient for most of the models that can be then deriving uh, the basic uh, characteristics of the ecosystem. And then when it's done constantly uh, so that it is repeated in a regular intervals or, or measured constantly, then that would be of course providing um, good grounds on, on, on analyzing also the dynamics of features and processes. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, convey my best regards to Marco Kulmola. I will, for sure. Thank you. So uh, we come to the last speaker before my observations of the hour session. This is um, Professor Mizui Ohashi, uh, currently, who currently works as a full professor in the University of Kuogo, Japan. Uh, she's a specialist of forest ecology in biochemistry. So in our session, we have a big deal of forest um, presentations what is uh, typical for uh, Yasa, by the way. And the roots goes to a um, number of very famous and important scientists who used to work in, um, um, in Yasa. Uh, she's a special, Mizuyo Hashi is a specialist um, in 
below ground ground biological processes of carbon dynamics and forest ecosystem. Uh, in her career, uh, Dr. Ohashi used to work in Finland in 2003 as a postdoc scientist in Finnish Forest Research Institute in Joensuu, Finland. In Finland, she joined an international project, Do Wood Ants Play an Important Role in Carbon and Nutrient Dynamics in boreal managed forests. In 2007, Mizui got associate professor position in School of Human Science and Environment, University of Huago. And then she got full professor position there in 2016. She started several new projects that includes role of wood roots on soil carbon dynamics and molecular composition of dissolved organic carbon in a forest in Finland and Japan. Now she wishes to connect her studies in different types of forests in Japan, Malaysia, and Finland. Please, um, Dr. Ohashi, the floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, can you listen me and uh, see yes, my screen? hear you well. Yeah, thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Mide Ohash, uh, working in University of Hyogo. Thank you for inviting me to this session. Uh, today I talk about my uh, field study in Finland mainly. I am field researcher and my study sites locates various countries, including Finland, Thailand, Malaysia, and Japan. My talk is much more local than the other talks, so I hope uh, my talk suits to your interest. So first, I want to explain why Finland. Uh, Finland is one of the countries that stocks huge amount of carbon in soil. You can see in this figure that soil carbon stock is very high in boreal region, and Finland has darker red color, suggesting high carbon threat country. In Finland, carbon stock is also increasing in forest by continuous so forest protection and management. This means Forest management is a key human activity affecting the carbon stock in Finland. Finland has a flat geophysical feature, and this contributes to keep the water resources in the land and uh, uh, keeping low amount of carbon outflow from the land to surrounding ocean. Climate in Finland is also suitable for keeping the carbon in soil because of low mean temperature and precipitation. So uh, this Finnish climate uh, inhabit organic matter decomposition in soil. So Finland is the country that uh, contribute carbon isolation from atmosphere because of, of its climate, geophysical feature, and human activities. This means Finland could be a model country for understanding the mechanisms of the carbon stretch in boreal ecosystems and for predicting its future changes. So today I focus on two questions and introduce my research activities in Finland relating to these two questions. First one is how carbon cycling in boreal forests are different from those of others. 
So here I introduce my research about the role of ants in carbon dynamics in boreal managed forests in Finland. This figure shows carbon cycling in a forest ecosystem. Please look at the lead circle, uh, the carbon flux from soil surface to atmosphere. The CO2 flux from soil surface is so called soil respiration. Soil respiration is the second largest flux in carbon cycling in a forest. All living or soil organisms, roots, soil animals, and microbes contribute to soil respiration. Soil microbes and roots would be the main source of CO2. Soil animals could increase CO2 emission directly and indirectly. Then, one of the most common soil animal in boreal forest, especially in Finland, is the leadwood ant. This animal is so-called Formica lufa group, consists from several species of genus Formica. Leadwood ants make a big mound in forest, like the one in the photo. The size of mound could be 1.5 meter height and two meter diameter. And ant mounds are made from little resin honeydew collected by ants. This means ant mounds accumulate a lot of carbon and minerals compared to surrounding forest floor. It is also known that uh, temperature and moisture in mounds are different from those in soil because of the ant activity. The special mound environment may affect the decomposition of mound material and uh, cause different um, carbon and mineral dynamics. This is figure explains the carbon hypothesis of carbon flow via ant mound. So carbon come into mound uh, by as little resin honeydew insects collected by ants. Then they decompose at the ant mount and the CO2 and DOC emission occur from the ant mount. This could be different from the CO2 emission and DOC reaching from the forest floor in Finnish forest. So the aim of this study is uh, the, we, we, set, we established two aims in this study. One is to develop a method to measure CO2 flux from ant mounds, and the other is to estimate the impact of mounds on total soil respiration. We established a study site in Kori National Park in Eastern Finland. Four different aged stands were selected to conduct experiments. In order to measure uh, carbon flux from ant mounds, we developed a special chamber like this figure. Basic structure of the chamber is a modified closed dynamic system. Then we made a big chamber to avoid disturbance of mound. Light and transparent material like vinyl seat were used to keep natural environmental condition and uh, to finish the measurement as soon as possible. We then uh, avoid to disturb ant behavior. This is a photo of CO2 flux measurement from ant mound using that special chamber. Environmental factors such as temperature and moisture content was also measured continuously using sensors 
in Antmount and the surrounding forest roar. So this is a part of the result of this experiment. We found that CO2 flux from Ant Mound was higher than surrounding soil respiration. And the temperature and moisture content in Ant Mound was also, were also higher than those in surrounding soil. And the difference between mound and soil increased in uh, growing season because of active ant, ant behaviors. There was no relationship uh, in soil most, uh, no relationship was observed between uh, CO2 flux and uh, moisture content, but we found exponential relationship with temperature in both of mound and uh, forest floor. We found that CO2 flux from mounds increased with stand age. However, the contribution to of mound, mound CO2 flux to total soil respiration was less than 1%, very small. We also simulated the changes in mound CO2 flux and soil respiration under global warming scenarios. Our results suggest that the impact on ant mound on total CO2 flux did not that will not change much under global warming condition. Now I introduce a, next, uh, another study about the effect of natural disturbance on carbon dynamics in Finnish boreal forests. The title could be changes in the quality of dissolved organic matter in soil water with time since last five year in boreal forest. It is known that most of the non-living organic carbon are mineralized by microbial decomposition and go away by soil respiration. But part of the decomposed carbon dissolved into soil water and flow away from the ecosystem. And little, no, little is known about the role of DOC in carbon cycling. However, DOC play an important role in detention and transport of nutrients and metals. Wildfire is an important trigger of the start of forest taxation in boreal forests. Fire seriously affects carbon stocks and uh, cycles and may also change the quality of uh, dissolved organic carbon. Therefore, the aim of this study is to clarify how the quality of DOC changes with time since last fire in boreal forest soil. This study site located in Scott Pine Forest in Finnish Lapland Barrio. We collected soil water from two different types of forests, uh, which have uh, six and 156 years old, respectively. Then we analyzed the collected soil wa water uh, using Fourier transfer ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. This technique is used for finding the molecular formula of uh, each molecule in DOC uh, in water sample. The technique, uh, this machine itself does not give the molecular formula, but we can get very accurate M per Z value of mass, spec, mass peaks uh, from this machine. And uh, this allow us to predict a molecular formula of each molecule in the sample.
using the number of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen atoms in the estimated formula, we can make one Krebelin diagram in order to divide the DOC molecules into seven biomolecular classes. Repeat, protein, amino sugar or carbohydrate, lignin, tannin, unsaturated hydrocarbon, and the condensed aromatic structure derived from the black carbon made by the fire. And this figure shows uh, the main results of this study. Our results showed lignin like molecule and dissolved black carbon molecule are higher in less than three bound forest. The peak intensity weight average molecular weight of molecular species that was not shared between the recent three bonds and long unbound sites were different in uh, amino sugar carbohydrate and uh, tannin like molecule and the dissolved black carbon. This means molecular composition of these classes changed by fire burning. So this is uh, the summary of these two studies. My answer to the first question is that forest living organisms such as ants contribute to produce a unique carbon cycle cycling in boreal forests. And the answer to the second question is that carbon molecule composition can change by five years. That is a trigger of forest succession in boreal region. Finally, in the end, I want to introduce my ongoing project in Japan. Now we have network study of Udi root dynamics called net, root net. So roots have, root, there is a mystery of root phenology in uh, forests. We don't know when roots are born and when they die. And we don't know how roots are born and how they die because they grow in soil and we cannot see them. So it is easy to understand life stages of leaves, branches, stems, above ground part, but it is very difficult to know life stages of pine roots. We don't know whether they have only one peak uh, growing in during the year or two peak growing during the year. In order to answer these questions, uh, to clarify these questions, uh, we, as we are trying to use scanner method. In this scanner method, we collect soil images in field by setting a scanner in a transparent box. Root behavior in the soil is monitored directly. Then root dynamics uh, is det detected by repeating the image collection. We developed already the manual for extracting root dy dynamics from a series of scanner images. Then we tried to determine the variation of root phenology in different regions in Japan now. We uh, established uh, nearly 15 uh, sites to compare fine root phenology in different regions in Japan. Then we established a root net uh, scientific network to exchange our uh, information and knowledge and uh, discuss our future uh, challenges. Uh, now, near, more than 50 people, including scientists and students, uh, belonging to uh, join this RootNet network. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Huishi, uh, Ohashi, and uh, your paper is open for uh, questions. Are there any questions? 
No. So no immediate discussion because everything was so clearly uh, reported. Thank you once again. And now, um, Sergey, I address Sergey Sizov. Can you start my presentation? I would like to share with you some points concerning uh, big data and uh, possible application of this. Uh, it is Arctic studies. Uh, next slide, please. So first, the notion of big data firstly appeared um, quite long ago. It was quite long, not in geological terms, but in our everyday terms. So the author of the big data term is Clifford Lynch, editor of Nature Journal. On September 3rd, 2008, he issued a special volume of the journal on the topic, how can technology that open up high possibilities to work with big data influence the future of science? That was followed by explosive growth of data volume and variety. Leap from the amount of initial data to the quality of recognized knowledge was, the, was a uh, characteristic feature of this new movement. Next slide, please. Little by little, but very fast at the same time, in the tens of the 21st century, revolution in data science appeared. The transition of the quality of the accumulated information to uh, excuse me, I just into the quality of the problem solution is called big data phenomenon. Today, it is one of the most discussed concepts in the IT science and industry. Data now are no longer seen as a statistic value. They have become the material for creating new economic values. In, the, in our century, in the ongoing century, software technologies like MapReduce of Google and Hadoop of Yahoo have appeared. For them, the original information is no longer needs to be lined up in neat database tables. In result, the big data processing technologies emerge without the previous rigid hierarchy and homogeneity. Next slide, please. And a very important thing happened. In the big data world, the search of causality will have to be abandoned in favor of the search for correlations. In other words, the data processing in order to answer the question why became replaced by the search of the answer to the question what is it. This change in the research paradigms shortens the transition to prediction. Actually, this is the step that never happened before. Maybe it happened only at the time when mathematical modeling appeared. And at that time, um, question why, why that happens, uh, became, started to be the most important. With the big data, still it is important, but this is not the mainstream of what is going on. The mainstream is to look for the um, correlations. For instance, what is more important in coronavirus studies? To understand who was the first uh, patient of this uh, pandemic and how this problem came to us, or 
to understand in details what is it. For instance, if, if we would know the correlations of the coronavirus with the absence of, of the vitamin C, if we would, we can say that people who eat many oranges and uh, mandarins and uh, drink vitamins, vitamin C are uh, better placed um, to, toward this pandemic. But we don't know that, unfortunately. Uh, next slide, please. Definition of big data is horizontal scaling is dividing the system into, into smaller structural components and spacing them into separate physical machines or increasing the number of services, nodes and processors that simultaneously perform the same function. Big data is structured and unstructured. The second point is the most important. We can, we should be able, be capable to store the big data in the way different types of data are uh, there. Texts, movies, um, remote sensing information, figures, uh, digits, all that should be together. So big data is structured and unstructured data of huge volumes and significant diversity, efficiently processed by horizontally scalable software, alternative to traditional DBMS. This is exactly what was said when I commented the previous slide. This is a Hadoop. Next slide, please. This is just the list of mathematical methods to extract, to extract knowledge from the big data. This is like a, a coin. Uh, big data, this is the data and principally new approach, mathematical approach to process this data. They are listed on this slide. And this is actually what in YASA is called systems analysis. So we can make a conclusion here saying that in the same way uh, how mathematical modeling became systems analysis for the uh, studies that uh, plan to answer the question why and the mathematical models uh, help to answer this question. In the same way, this list of methods helps to answer the question, what is it in details? And this is uh, modern systems analysis, at least how Yasa understands that. Next slide. Classical example of big data is the internet. You see impressive figures of uh, how much is, um, how big is this world of the data, of the big data. Next slide, please. However, not all the data is big. It, it, it should not be mixed between good data and bad data. Uh, big data and not big data, this is different. Very important, very good, very precise data can be not big data. For instance, in, um, I work in earth sciences and in our sciences, we know just five types of data that satisfy uh, the conditions of the big data. This is meteorological data, earth remote sensing data, data ecological superstation smear two information, 
oil and gas seismic surveys, seismograms uh, monitoring. And the upcoming big data, this is Arctic comprehensive information. And this is a great source of uh, big data. Since our time is over, I will stop here and just will um, make an appeal uh, to our session participants to discuss how um, smear data can be affiliated with the big data um, postulates. Uh, recently, I gave a paper on this matter to one of the Russian journals translated into English called the Physics of the Earth. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we had a very nice session. Let's uh, have maybe short discussion, five minutes, if anyone would like to um, comment something uh, particular. No speakers in the discussion, and we are late uh, at the same time. So thank you very much to all of you. I think that was wonderful session, wonderful speakers, and uh, the moderator enjoyed that very much. And hope this will be well reported in the YASA information boards. <laughs>